Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the 11th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee. Uh, I would ask everyone in the room to ensure the mobile phones are silent on silent. Uh, of course, it's acceptable to use mobile phones uh, for social media, but please don't take photographs or film proceedings. First item on the agenda is a session on mental health, and we'll focus in this session on uh, children and adolescent mental health services. Children and adolescent mental health services. Um, I'd like to welcome to the committee uh, uh, Lorna Wigan, Chief Operating Officer uh, NHS Tayside, Tracy Gillis, uh, Medical Director NHS Forth Valley, uh, Jack, Jackie Irvin, uh, Children and Families Committee, Social Work Scotland, and Barry Syme, Chair of uh, the Association of Scottish Principal Educational Psychologists and Principal Educational Psychologist uh, Glasgow Service. Um, we're going to move straight to questions. We have under an hour for this session. Um, Alex, would you like to start? Yes, and good morning to the panel. Thank you very much for coming to see us today. Um, everyone in this room is aware that the last mental health strategy expired at the end of last year, and we're still awaiting a new one. Um, given that over the summer we learned the news that some children are waiting as much as two years in some parts of the country um, for treatment at CAMS, and that some of the CAMS inpatient beds are sometimes rendered unavailable because staff are not there to service them. Um, can the panel give us reflections on um, what they hope will be in the next mental health strategy and particularly with a focus on CAMS and whether CAMS itself should have its own kind of strategy underpinning that? I think in, in, that's one of the points that we make in our submission from Social Work Scotland is really that in looking at CAMS in isolation is not going to solve the problem. So really it's that continuum from sort of lower level tier one to tier two services through to the CAMS tier three and, and tier four. Um, because we know often and has happened in the past and possibly uh, still is happening, children are referred to CAMS when there could be other services that they could get earlier on in their journey of, of, of mental well-being. Um, and that then creates a kind of bottleneck into CAMS. So I think the mental health strategy needs to look across that variation of provision and make that those connections helpfully. I wonder if it would be helpful for me to say something about Forth Valley's waiting times, because they have been uh, particularly low in the recent ISD reported figures. And I'd like to um, give the committee um, some uh, reassurance that we've taken this extremely seriously and put a lot of time and effort into working with the service. And I'm very pleased now that our uh, waiting times in terms of 18-week referral to treatment were 74% for children in September and 87% in October. So that's been a very significant turnaround in those waiting times. And you might have been referring to our very low waiting times in June. Those low waiting times are partly influenced by making sure that children who have been waiting a very long time are seen. And obviously, as those children come through the service, they do have a, a negative impact on the overall RTT time that's reported. But it is still important that children are, are seen and prioritised appropriately. a perspective of looking at the whole life continuum I would like to see much more emphasis in terms of from birth right through to adulthood in terms of how the pathways of care are provided I'd like to see much more emphasis on building up at tier one in terms of both family resilience but also individual young people children's resilience as well um, and I think a continued development in terms of tier three and tier four mm -hmm to ensure that we can provide as comprehensive a service as possible for those young people and children who do need that level of service. Um, I think uh, it's imperative that we work um, across agencies, but also with voluntary sector, third sector, and families and, and young people themselves to get this right. So I would like to think there'll be an emphasis on that in the next um, strategy that we see. Just to pick up on my question about um, the lack of availability of Tier 4 beds, uh, we put in an FRI over the uh, course of the summer, and, and the numbers coming back as to those um, kids who were referred to Tier 4 beds but turned away because they weren't available, only uh, not because they were full, but because there weren't staff to man them, was quite astonishing. Um, is there... Uh, I mean, would you like to see further investment, particularly given the fact we have no tier four beds north of Dundee, that that, that is an actual gap in our uh, provision within Scotland? I think 
think in terms of, um, we currently have all 12 beds, beds open in our facility, which serves the north. Um, it's not always just to do with um, staff. It can be um, in terms of the young people who are actually in the unit at that point in time. Um, and a risk assess from our, uh, assessment from our clinical and multidisciplinary team about what's safe to actually um, look after in that one facility. I would like to see more emphasis in terms of um, keeping children and young people out of um, inpatient facilities and we can do that and we have seen some good models emerging in terms of intensive support at home. We have a programme called MACX which actually puts in very intensive multi-agency, multidisciplinary support to keep the children in their family home and education. Um, so I think it's a combination of both. I don't think it's just beds. I think it's all the infrastructure that we can put into the community services as well. But is there a gap? I mean, it, I accept that. I think that uh, certainly chimes with a lot of what we hear about um, keeping people, uh, giving people care in the community, and that's absolutely laudable. But are all the needs being met? I mean, if, if we're getting people who are referred to uh, tier four beds and turned away, are they then getting that support at home that you describe? Some of them will. Um, some of them who need admission, obviously, would need to seek out um, a bed for them elsewhere and um, that's suitable to their needs um, but we have seen as well through work we've done through our eating disorder pathway that our admissions have gone down through um, more intensive fa family behaviour cognitive support that we're putting in so I don't think it's simply just a matter of keeping putting more beds into the system I think it's looking to see what that individual child or young person requires in terms of support um, Intervention at an early stage, if possible, obviously, because it stops the deterioration. Um, but if they do require that, we have to be sure that the inpatient option is the right option. Um, I honestly have not um, seen any data in terms of a whole system risk assessment um, that would tell us how many beds would be the right number of beds. I suppose just to add to that in relation to um, the point about trying to keep children supported young people in the community there's probably an issue also certainly from my experience in Greater Glasgow and Clyde um, of needing to manage that transition from inpatient out to the community and certainly we've I've my team have done a piece of work on that I'm responsible for both children's social work services and health services have a responsibility for community camps so we've made sure that we've got a transition guidance there sometimes young people can get stuck in the inpatient um, position and there's a level of anxiety certainly from family and professionals around them about them coming back into the community so there are advantages and disadvantages and I think um, short stay is obviously preferable obviously we have some very complex cases that will stay in longer but I'm not, I'm not in a position to say I think what we probably all experience across the country is variation in terms of availability um, at one point our 12 bedded unit was full at the moment I understand we have vacancies and I think it's just it's very difficult to kind of anticipate that but I would, I would agree that I'm, I'm not aware of any um, whole system look at what the indicative needs would be for inpatient beds. Um, yes, thank you. On the, the issue of rejected referrals, um, many submissions highlighted the increasing number of referrals to CAMS. Um, some felt this reflected the growing need, um, but they were concerned at the number of rejected referrals. Last week we heard from Sam H, um, and they were calling for a wider review of how we refer. And they also wanted to understand better what's happening at Tier 1. Um, and Jack Irvin, you, you said there that some young people are being referred to CAMS when they could be referred to other services. And just finally, um, latest figures show, latest ISD figures show that 18.7% of the referrals were rejected in 2015 16. And West Lothian Council, for example, have called for an urgent review. They're very concerned that some children and young people are missing out on help that they may urgently need. Um, I suppose I can't comment specifically on West Lothian. What I would say is that what we've recognised is that if um, if children are referred to Tier 3 CAMS and they could actually be fitted into or be dealt with appropriately at Tier 1 or 2, so, for example, school counselling, then that creates a kind of 
a demand that's maybe not being addressed as early as it could be. Um, we've, we've worked, I think, across the country in partnership ways to try and build that tier two service, but they are funded in variable you know, ways. So some of the funding will come from councils, some will come from health boards, some will come from education service within councils, some will be third sector. And I think the variation in terms of what we're experiencing across Scotland is probably reflective of that variation about what's sitting around CAMS. So I know what's in, in my area, I've heard from other colleagues what's in their area, but I know in some areas they'll be really short of those um, supports. And I think even at Tier 1, um, there's a real need to support the development and confidence of staff who are working with children in the communities, whether that's nurseries, primary schools, secondary schools, so that they're able to deal with and not become overly anxious. And I think one of the things we, we manage at times is the professional anxiety around children, which doesn't help children, um, and it certainly it doesn't help provide things then and there when they need it for as long as they need it. So some children might be escalated into calms when they could have been managed and helped to, uh, to recover within, uh, within Tier 1. I suppose one of the other aspects is that uh, quite often children are experiencing adverse childhood experiences, so coming to the kind of family relationships. And um, from the point of view of the CAM service and Tier 1 and 2, we're seeing a slight increase in growth of functional family therapy in the country, but that's very, very variable and, and quite costly. Um, so we've invested in Western Bartonshire and certainly Glasgow in functional family therapy, um, but it's from 11 upwards. And I think the, the feeling is that actually children be behaviour and, and, and signs of difficulty start much earlier than that. Nursery into primary one transition, um, even even earlier, but certainly into the primary early primary years. So, it's that package of options, um, and I think we sometimes try and fit the child into the services we've got, as opposed to saying what service do we need for that child, if it's not available. I think um, last week's evidence session there was a view that you know better training for teachers and so on would enable them to help young people instead of feeling that they had to refer on because they didn't have the the capacity themselves can i just ask um how this rejected referral is experienced by the young person themselves are they going along to a tier three or tier four what, 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 what you know how does that how does that work I can tell you how it happens in nhst side so the referral will come in and it comes in via various routes so it could be from a teacher from a gp um, from a school nurse um, and that referral is um, then looked at by a multidisciplinary team in terms of the information that they have available if they require more they will seek that um, and then once they've looked at the referral they will then see whether it fits into tier three and whether they require to be seen by the specialists or whether there's an alternative um, that that child or young person should access and the referrer will always be contacted to say why they're not suitable and what other options are available and signposted to other services that may be more appropriate and also some information advice tools that may be beneficial as well. So it's not a matter of the young person having to come up and then be told that there isn't any need for them to be there. I think I don't know if that's similar practice. Yes. And that, that would our experience as well. We've done a lot of work at looking at our referral criteria with GPs and other um, primary healthcare services to make sure that those are uh, well understood and agreed by all. And then we provide um, information to go back if a, if a referral doesn't progress forward following a uh, multidisciplinary discussion, the same as Lorna's discussed. We also have um, an advice only email referral service mm -hmm. and we have a professional advice to advice line mm -hmm. as well. So there are, there are ways for people to discuss referrals or to receive further information about services. Thank you, Convener. Is that your experience, Barry, as a pr practitioner? It depends how they, they get to CAMS. I think we, in Glasgow and, and our other authorities, we, we try to uh, follow the kind of GIRF multi-agency uh, meeting uh, and we're trying to push the referrals. And I hate that word referral because it implies you're putting it someplace else. But we would say the ownership remains within the establishment of the school. So a referral to CAMS should go through that multi-agency mm -hmm. group, whether you call it a joint support team or a joint assessment team. And I think the advantage of that is actually having uh, people around the table from social work, health, education, where you can actually give some advice about the appropriateness of that referral. Now, the majority of referrals we know come through GPs, but there's a piece of work to be done with GPs to be saying, right, how do you link in GIRFEC with your practice? Uh, 
so that the most appropriate referrals go to CAMS, uh, but if it's not deemed appropriate, then what other supports are there? Because there are, there are lots of supports around, but quite often it's, it's pr pretty much a postcode. Uh, so you find even within a large city like Glasgow, certain parts of the city will have certain resources and others won't. Uh, so it's having that kind of local knowledge. So in Glasgow, we have 28 joint support teams and we would, are working towards using kind of that GIRFEC model. Referrals would go through the joint support team. So that's on what captures uh, the most appropriate ones going, but also saying that if it's not going to CAMS or if it's coming back from CAMS, it should also go back to the joint support team because what other supports are available? I think one of the issues also is the quality of the referral in terms of when it gets to CAMS. So, you know, the, if it's got the most pertinent information in there, it gives them a much clearer, quicker idea about whether that's an appropriate referral and, and providing assistance. In, uh, from my point of view from Western Berkshire, we did, had a pilot with GPs and education uh, colleagues in relation to sharing information around Griffith. It's been widely reported to, to government ministers. Um, and one of the outcomes of that very early doors was that um, quite often schools knew the child, the family, much better than the GP. You know, they would have parents, they would know the siblings, they would have that background knowledge. So what we moved to doing was allowing... Um, Rather than the GP, not that, not that education cycle, you know, educational services aren't allowed to, but just encouraging education to convey to the GP, look, we can do this referral if that's what your mum's saying, you're supporting it. But we don't know whether you've done the referral or not, but we also think that's required. We can complete that. And, and as everyone has said, if referrals are, are not seem to be um, appropriate, there is a response back to the referrer as to why that was. But but we do encourage people to use the telephone. Um, uh, kind of conversation around the referral in the first instance, if not at the point that they're they're not accepted. Okay, Claire. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, so leading on from from what we're talking about in, in referrals here, and, and really, if we could just expand on it a little bit, uh, we had um, some of the the panel last week and some of the written evidence that we've had talked about um, differing referral criteria for for different services and uh, perhaps the need for some national guidance on on referrals. And I, I'd be interested to to hear um, the panel's view on that across health boards in terms of referral criteria and even in terms of the tiers of um, patients that they'll see. Um, I think it would be advantageous to have some um, national work where at least um, if you're a young person or a child or a, even you know a family member, you understand what type of service you're going to get and how it's going to be provided for you. Um, but there is no doubt there's variation at the moment. No, no one else wants to comment on that. So, 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 sorry, I, I would agree with my colleague. There is variation, uh, and there, it's not even across Scotland. It's within neighbouring authorities and neighbouring health boards. Uh, certainly in, in Glasgow, we find that because my particular area of the South City borders three other areas, uh, and it, it does cause problems for parents. I had one uh, a couple of weeks ago where a parent had been told uh, that the child required a, an educational assessment by an educational psychologist, uh, and there was an expectation set there. And when we were contacted because of the geographical area. Our, our threshold within Glasgow is different, so I, I think there is a piece of work to be done there, just from, from our perspective. So if there is um, differences in, in referral criteria, then would that account perhaps for why there is such a, a, a variation in the accepted rate of uh, referrals sent to your services? Are, we, are you getting... Uh, lots of inappropriate referrals sent to you because they don't meet that criteria and that would seem to me be, to be quite a waste of of healthcare professionals times of your time and also setting up expectations from from families and from young people that they're going to receive a service that really isn't appropriate to them occurs more in terms of the availability of what other support is there particularly within um, so I suppose I would look at it uh, more from a health perspective although I think what my um, uh, colleagues have said it is is very appropriate but actually what we're also seeing is quite a lot of pressure in primary care resources with a lot of GPs who might be doing locums or not working in the area um, and moving from um, 
you, you know that that some of that fragmentation of primary care services that that we're all experiencing with difficulties in GP recruitment means that sometimes people are less aware of what is available locally where that does differ particularly with third sector um, or local authority provision just where things might be called different things so I think there's some need for a little bit um, I guess just better signposting to, to make people aware of wh what there is. I think another reason is we haven't really touched on some of the admin processes that sit behind all these services, but where referrals aren't necessarily received electronically, then sometimes they just don't contain the enough demographic information or all the pieces of information that would be useful. And that can lead to somebody asking for more information and the referral to be sent again. So it's not that the referral is necessarily inappropriate, it just didn't have all the right information to start with. And those are counted in the ISD numbers. So it's, it's just important to separate out those that are administratively incomplete from those which don't meet the referral criteria. So if those are um, issues that you're picking up, what are you doing as health boards to address those? So, so we have put in place a, a way to make sure that we can receive as much information electronically as possible and to then be able to work with um, all our colleagues in local authority and third sector to be able to provide uh, electronically available information for people about what support services there are so that can be passed on to the young person so that can be kept up to date and also that uh, there's a, a push system of the advice sheet back out to referrers, so that can be handed over at the point of the referral being made to let them know what other support is available. The other thing is we use, um, obviously, our information and our data that we get, so um, we actually have a, a dashboard for the service um, and for the clinicians, obviously, to use, and that lets them look at themes. So if they see that there's a particular um, issue in terms of a school or a cluster of GP practices, then it means you can go back in and do some further education and try and understand why um, the issues are arising. So it's, it's I think, a mixture of um, trying to make sure the information is easily accessible, trying to ensure that people um, are up to date with what's available because things change, um, and then ensuring that um, if you've got an issue, you can identify it quite quickly and then try and do something about that. Can okay. I ask um, what happens after a referral is rejected? I may, you may have met, addressed this and I've not picked up on this, but what happens after a, a referral is rejected? Well, in Tayside, what happens is obviously um, the referrer is contacted and ordered to tell them that why the child has not, or the young person has not met the criteria, what other services would be more appropriate, and also signposting to any other support, information, advice, any tools that may helpful, be helpful in that individual situation. But there's always a, 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 refer, a contact back to the referrer, whoever that is, and it's not always a GP, it could be a school nurse or a teacher or whatever. And is that then, um, is that then tracked? So no, once once they're referred back, then obviously they're, they're discharged from the service at that point. So they're referred back, and then there's no follow up to see whether that action that was, you know, um, referred back was successful. So we don't know whether the rejections result in. We the would people know. coming back through the system. Yeah, we would or, we, we would monitor that just in terms of how do you um, monitor it? for readmissions. Obviously, everybody's got a CHI number, so we no, would no, be able I'm to. I'm not necessarily saying readmission. But no, how, how do you monitor if they're re-referred to outpatients? No, or, no, no, how do you monitor what happens after they've been rejected? Can I maybe come in on that? Mm -hmm. I think obviously. If the referral has been from a named person, so education or health visitor, etc., or from a lead professional, predominantly social work services, then that case, and I think that's why the, the, the use of the word I think you mentioned earlier, referral, is, is a bit, feels like something being moved from one place to the other. So in terms of GERFEC te um, terminology, we, we've moved to talk, talking about requests for assistance. So the originating referrer, if you want to put it that way, or lead professional named person still maintains responsibility for that child um, and that case. Um, obviously, there are a variety of things that a lead professional or named person might do, so they might go back to CAMS and have a further dialogue about why that hasn't been accepted, but they would certainly come back to the sort of team around the child to look at what other service can be put in place for that child. Um, that's obviously more difficult if there are fewer alternatives um, but certainly, from my knowledge and from our growing um, 
uh, implementation of GERFEC, that's certainly helping keeping an eye on that child and making sure they don't just drop off the plate. And do you collect data on that? Um, is, there, is there a standard reporting system for that? No, I would have to say probably nationally, no, we're not in a position of doing that because we have different information systems across social work services, across education authorities and health authorities. So do you know, then know how many have been rejected and then come back? No, I, I would be honest to tell you, I wouldn't have that information. But I, from a point of view of being okay. head of children's health and care, I would know in my area if we had an issue, um, a bit like your. Is there anyone anyone in the panel would they be able to know that? Mm. No. no. Okay, Marie. The transition from child and adolescent services up to adult services. Um, we heard last week that there are different cutoffs in different parts of the country, some relating to full-time education, some 16, some 18. And we also heard from the representative of the Scottish Youth Parliament and also from the lady from Sam H that um, they would really prefer there to be a bespoke service for children sort of between 16 and 24, seeing them through these really you know, vital periods of transition in their life so that any damaging consequences from having been severely ill at that period of time are limited so that for example if somebody has had to come out of education because of their illness they're still in a team that can support them to get back into education even though they might be 17 and a half. Um, I just wondered if that's something that you would support or um, if you have any thoughts about that particular variation in the service. Our services currently go to 18. I, I think um, it's very difficult to make one size that fits all in this area. I, I, I would agree with you. I think there are some individuals who would very much benefit from a, a very clearly staged gradual transition and maintaining uh, that uh, uh, holistic team approach um, to, to a longer period of time. Equally, there are some uh, people at the age of 16, 17, 18 who very clearly wish to mark that they do feel they're, they're ready to move to adult services and would actually prefer to be managed in adult services. So, so I think it's difficult to make one size that fits all. And maybe what we should be doing is, is making those opportunities more available where they, where they are um, appropriate. People are telling us that's you know would be the best um, pathway of care from them. Then I think we should be listening to that, um, and I think it's about looking at what we've got currently and what what are the steps that we then need to take for those who would benefit from that type of approach. But there are some young people who definitively will um, opt to move to adult services. And sometimes that can be because of their experience in a young person's unit where the age group may be quite young, actually, and therefore, therefore they feel that that's not the right place for them either. So I think you're right. I think there is um, a kind of age where they fit neither probably in one nor in the other, and it's probably just finding for them what, what that would look like in terms of their individual pathway. In fact, Claire mentioned that last week we were talking about it, it referrals at the other end of the age scale where there used to be a 65 cutoff where you went to older adults and actually perhaps naming a number isn't useful. It's more about based on the individual's needs would be a more useful way of looking at it. And that's what you guys are saying as well. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about, and it might just be me who doesn't understand how this works, so please excuse me. I just wondered how educational psychology fits in with CAMS. Um, and how the services work together. So I'm thinking, I, I, I imagine that somebody with autism spectrum disorder or ADHD is more likely to be, um, the lead professional is more likely to be an educational psychologist rather than a psychiatrist. And, and some people, the lead professional will be a psychiatrist. I just wonder how the two systems work together and um, in terms of providing care. I think over the past uh, probably 20 years, uh, the role of educational psychologist and working in mental health has certainly increased. Uh, last year, uh, ASPEP undertook an audit of all uh, services in Scotland, 32 services, uh, and we did a, an event sampling for a week to look at how much time we actually spent on mental health. And it came out that 29% of our time was actually on mental health work. Uh, that ranged from direct work with working with young people and children to advice, etc. So uh, across Scotland, you'll find that uh, 
services will vary depending on their size because it gets to about capacity. I mean, you've got places with you know, two psychologists and places with 40 psychologists. So it's an economy of scale. But uh, I think the last count, there are about 20 different interventions within mental health that education psychology probably offer, ranging from cognitive behaviour therapy, uh, eye movement, desensitisation, uh, reprocessing, uh, video interactive guidance. So we, we've developed a skill set and what we'd see is how, how do we fit in with the tier? And I think it's taken a long time for educational psychology to get their head around the tier model that, that works. Uh, so we're now trying to, to target our, assist, our, our interventions at a different tiered level, uh, but really trying to focus on tier one, tier two, because that's where we know the kind of gap is. Uh, in fact, we go even broader than that and say it's that kind of tier zero, that universal promoting resilience. So that's what we're pretty good at as education psychologists. So we try and f target our interventions and focus on those evidence-based interventions. Uh, tier one, tier two, prime example would be Safe Talk, for example. So my authority, uh, we really push Safe Talk, which is you know, suicide awareness uh, training. So we are have every establishment has got a Safe Talk member of staff trained. Uh, we're now rolling out Safe Talk to S5, S6 pupils, uh, and that's been done by education psychology alongside health and social work so, uh, services. So we can work with them. Uh, in response to your comment about autism spectrum disorder, how would we work with CAMS? Well, the diagnosis would either come from Scottish Centre for Autism or from the local CAMS team, depending on the setup. But all you're getting there is a diagnosis, which is absolutely fine. It has to be a medical diagnosis. But it then comes back to what are you going to do with that diagnosis? He's got ESD. So what, what are the implications? And I think that's what, that's one of the work that we are doing with CAMS at the minute in education psychology is saying, right, the, the, the implications of that diagnosis are, and you need to help us with that, because that child has got to go to school, has got to be educated. So what are the implications about his... Uh, sensory issues, so he can't cope with loud noises, he can't cope with the dinner hall. How do we then make environmental changes to that child's curriculum so that they can be within their, their local school? And I think that's where the kind of partnership working comes in. And I think it's certainly improving. Uh, and I think there's further work to be done. And certainly there's ongoing discussion in certainly with Greater Glasgow and Clyde CAMS, uh, and particularly clinical psychology, about how we can actually more formalise that in a better way so we know exactly what we're doing. And when we're looking at, because the focus of much of the, um, it, much of our focus has been on CAMS, when we're looking at CAMS, are we capturing that activity? I, 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 I don't think we, we are. I, th I think it's an untapped resource of, uh, we, we would say, I mean, all education psychologists are uh, health uh, HCPC trained or, or registered, so we have to conform to those guidelines. Uh, we have the skills because part of the training, you know, is very. There are similarities with the training with clinical psychology. Uh, we also have to make the, the difference between clinical psychology and CAMS because the two are separate things. Uh, but I, I don't think it necessarily has been captured. Uh, I think it is, is a, a resource that could be be used more widely. Okay, thank you. Ivan. Yeah, thanks, Gina. Thanks, panel. Um, I wanted to just um, explore briefly the, um, the issue of how you measure the performance of the system as a whole. Now, clearly, that there's a target in place for waiting time at Tier 3, um, which seems to be the main kind of indicator you're using. So I, I just want to understand, is that the right thing to measure? Should you be measuring other things as well? Um, and are there unintended consequences of measuring that particular indicator? And then if you get any thoughts on that. I think there's a view uh, which I would concur with that measuring just the, the waiting times as a hard outcome is fairly limited. Obviously, it's a real indication, though, if people aren't getting a service. Um, a lot of health boards I'm aware of have moved, and certainly Great Glasgow and Clyde have, to the CAPA model, which is the Choices and Partnership um, approach, which allows you to look more at sort of general outcomes for the family and the child. Collating that can be difficult, though, on a, on a local area basis, um, or certainly on a health board basis, but certainly that's, um, we're looking more at outcomes, I think, around reintegration back into education, reintegration back into communities. So just having a calm service in itself would be a bit limited in, 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 in assessing whether that's working or whether that was right. for. And the other bit, again, I suppose it comes back to that transition back into education communities, even if you haven't been in an inpatient bed, is about helping those professionals around that child continue on that support and understand what's made a difference. So there's a real issue, I think, for communication 
Um, and, and, and that's why the partnership approach is, is providing, I think, more of a holistic, because it's not a start, calms, end, calms, back to life. It's a start, calms, and then what, what you know, educating other people um, about what needs to happen for that young person. In some areas, and it's, again, it's not consistent, it's variable. There are um, teams within CAMS and Western Balance, Young People in Mind, we have other areas that have it, where they will work with carers, and um, that can be foster carers, residential carers, or families, about helping them to understand the behaviour that might be exhibited by their young person, so that they can understand what the premise of that is, and, and therefore how to respond better. So that also provides good outcomes. So do you measure that? We would measure on an individual child basis, and I think this is the difficulty we have with any outcome approach um, across Scotland. We've certainly been discussing that with colleagues in the care inspectorate, is that your ability to measure that, aggregate that up from a one child uh, to the population is, is very difficult. Why is it difficult? I mean, you measure was the outcome, if you want to call it that, for that child successful, and then you aggregate up all of those I suppose individuals. It's because it's a subjective question about whether the outcome is right, and I suppose the best person to give that that view would be the child and parent. So mm -hmm. a professional can say, yes, we think we've achieved an outcome. Um, we measure population um, information in relation to numbers of referrals, number of children who are looked after, number of children who are referred to the report. It's a very different thing when you're looking to measure for children who are presenting with very different circumstances, whether their outcomes are improving. You can, you are, we are measuring them, but aggregating that up is more challenging, particularly nationally. And I think we, we don't have good systems, as you've heard earlier. Um, health has a separate system from social work, as does from education. So actually... Um, to actually try and do that work takes a lot of man effort and hours and then that takes away from the time that you've actually got to provide service so there is a balance. I think access to service is important but it's only one indicator um, and I think we would all agree that you would want to have some more qualitative um, outcomes that you're measuring as well both for children families but also in terms of how we're using the resource um, and to be able to understand that variation better and is it the right variation because sometimes variation is right but sometimes it's not um so i suppose the question was the performance measurement of the system right and i think yep. what i'm hearing is you're telling me it's difficult to measure the performance of the system so we won't no we do we do measure obviously um, right. we have a whole dashboard of um different measures which we agreed with our clinicians, with right. our multidisciplinary okay. teams. So the question was, the, there's by. one headline number there, which is the waiting time target at tier yes. three. And the question was, what other measures should we perhaps use that are measurable, mm -hmm. right? Um, and are there unintended consequences of having the primary measure as the waiting time target at tier three? Answer that question. Could I maybe make a comment from an education perspective about how we actually kind of monitor? Uh, because we don't look at waiting times. What you'd look at is, is actually outcomes uh, and how you track those outcomes over time. And I think what we are doing is a number of services are actually looking at if you're doing a, a direct piece of work, you can either use standardised assessments, core, whatever, to actually measure before and after. To some extent, that's a pretty dumb way of doing it. Uh, the better way is actually to specify at the outset what, what you're actually looking from this. And I think that's a kind of fundamental thing about referral to CAMS. What are you actually wanting out of that referral or for that piece of work? So if a piece of work was coming into an education psychology, well, the first thing we'd ask is, right, what do you want from us to do? And then we will agree we will do it or not. And they will measure the outcome at the end of it to say, right, are you in agreement with the original, you know, what, what your, the intended goal was? But you then you have, also have to measure that over time. Because a piece of work could be, you could do a piece of video interactive guidance or parenting work with a, with a, with a family and the parents say, I'm a lot happier. And then the case is effectively discharged and inactivated. But down the line, is that child still in mainstream education? And I think that's what we need to be better at. I think that's what, in education, we're starting to do. Are doing that then? Yes, we are. Right. And we're starting to measure it, certainly. Right, okay. And that's part of it's been driven by Education of Scotland okay. as part of the inspection process. But again, we're slightly smaller. It's how you do yeah. that nationally across CAMS. And is that a better measure than the waiting time target at tier three as a headline measure? I think it is because ultimately, right. if you're just going to keep on forcing that waiting time, that's where you're going to put your money. Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get to. Yeah. The problem you've got is um, if people are saying that target isn't a good target. Okay. 
what can you put in its place? And I'm not hearing anything that's made. Well, I'm hearing something from, from yourself, Barry. Um, and you're right, what you measure gets done. But if you're not measuring the right thing, then it's not getting done. But I'm kind of a bit disappointed. There isn't a, here's what we want to measure. It all sounds a bit vague, to be fair. Okay. Statement rather than a question, Tom. A very uh, quick question um, uh, for, for Jack Evan. Just to pick up on uh, something the convener um, raised um, the issue of what happens to those who are rejected um, from CAMS, and you mentioned in your answer that the uh, I think the data required to answer that really wasn't available nationally. Um, do you believe that, and um, there's a kind of greater need for data sharing between services? I, what I meant was that the, um, the how a rejection is dealt with will probably vary somewhat across the country. I can only speak about my health board area, although I'm here to speak on behalf of Social Work Scotland. Um, so I think you know it might be one of the things that you want to reinforce in the in the mental health strategy in relation to the management of that uh, process and that uh, the information going back. And I mean, I think it's standard that information will always go back to the referrer as to what is other, otherwise, what, what was the reason for the rejection or what other service might be more preferable um, or more appropriate for the child? I'm, that's, I'm not quite sure exactly what you're wanting me to answer there. It was just given this sort of range of services. Do you think the kind of data sharing between services at the moment is, is seamless enough, do you think? No, I don't think it is. I think there's work still to be done on that. I and mean, I think, you know, the, the GPs that we involved in our pilot, it went very well locally. Um, we are still looking to roll that out from one area of our patch to the next. I mean, West of Arch is very small. I mean, clearly, um, data sharing is with consent at the moment as well. So if families are presenting to their GP and presenting their school with difficulty, then that's much easier for us to then say, well, it might be helpful to find the you know, your pastoral care teacher to speak to GP and do the referral on, on their behalf or with them. Um, GPs always get a uh, um, notification of whether a child's been accepted into CAMS, even if they're not the referrer. So that's, you know, so there's a, there's, that's helpful so that they have that up-to-date um, information. But uh, I suppose there's the issue about communication generally around what you're experiencing in a local area with the demand at the time and making sure that that comes to all services to address it in terms of a sort of solution focused way um, so you know we do that through our community planning partnership children's uh, sort of services strategy work and we make sure that we have a particular focus on children's um, mental health and well-being within that and that reports up uh, to the community planning partnership and clearly if we were having significant difficulties in managing services or accessing services that would be one of the things we would report up and that may be to do with resource it may be to do with a spike in demand it could be to do with um, a lack of appropriate services at lower levels. And just I wonder if any of the other members of the panel would like to comment on the issue of uh, data sharing. It seems that there seems to be, uh, uh, in some areas, that perhaps it's insufficient, and whether the lack of data sharing is potentially a, a barrier to uh, better outcomes for users of the service. I suppose my comment would be that, uh, in general, we will all have data sharing agreements and protocols that, that specify what we can share and the levels of, of consent and the information that goes back. I think, I think those, uh, those principles and protocols that are set out are probably different from having systems that speak yeah. to each other easily on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. um, and that's probably where there's a greater need. I think on that systems issue, I mean, it's not just that all of education services have a different system from the all of, of social work. Within social work across the 32 local authorities, there are different information systems in terms of their client, your held record. Um, so that, you know, they don't speak to each other. And uh, within health, there are different um, levels of, of, of um, recording for client held information, so their own record. So it's not just three systems that aren't suitable to, to make a connectivity. There are variations in that. That's where the complexity comes, and obviously trying to address that's quite... Um, I think the teams around the children, children share information and work well together. Yeah. Um, I think, um, obviously, I think what we've got is IT systems that don't enable that to work seamlessly and in real time and smoothly. So um, we are embarking on a product that will enable our um, 
social work and our health and other colleagues to have a single system that they will be then able to see all the information that's appropriate for them to see in respect to that child and young person. Um, and that's been ruled out at the moment. So um, I think the information sharing is there. And when you've got a child in front of you, they've got a single plan. And that plan is developed by the multidisciplinary, multi-agency voluntary sector um, to support that child. But obviously, if you're an individual and you're going into that family and it's a paper-based system, then actually you don't always have all the access to all the information at that time. Um, so that's the solution we're working on at the moment in terms of enabling that to happen so that it's there when you need it. If we had more time, I would get you to explain functional family therapy, but I, I I could, I could have a guess. I could have a guess. Um, um, in the Social Work Scotland uh, submission, they talk about a much more holistic approach needed early intervention, and that um, a better way, best way to deal with mental ill health is through a social model. I couldn't. Uh, there's not a word of that I would disagree with, and I totally endorse that because I think much of this is about poverty, inequality, poor housing, poor environment, and the rest of it. Um, in a previous inquiry I was involved in to looked after children, there was a number of people spoke about the need for social workers or social work. Previously, there would be social work assistants. Even some people referred to them as homemakers from years ago. All of that stuff where they went in and, and done uh, fairly basic um, work with families, getting people into a routine, you know, systems of uh, behaviour and uh, boundaries and all that kind of stuff. Um, I personally think that that's desperately needed. Um, but how can that be done in the current climate when local government budgets are under such pressure? And following on from that, do you have the uh, human resources, the people on the ground who are able to deliver that, but also the other range of services that are involved with CAMS? I think you're, you're asking me obviously a very sensitive question, but what I would say to you is that we, we still have a model of, of what we'd call home helpers or family support assistants. Um, and, uh, but that, again, w is a very precarious uh, service to keep afloat in terms of the current financial uh, climate. Um, and in terms of, uh, uh, you know, if, if I'm as responsible for social work services in my area, uh, we've some very difficult decisions to make. Western Bartonshire, so, uh, but I won't be any different from anywhere else in the country. How many people are delivering that service on the ground in Western Bartonshire? Well, we have in the region of about 48 to 50 social workers qualified yeah. in field work that would be out in communities. We you have. See, but can, I, can I stop you there? Just in that inquiry that we did, yeah. we spoke to social workers who were saying that given the pressures that they're under, yeah. that element of their work has largely gone and they, they don't do that very much at all these days? Well, I think, you know, in the 21st century review of social work, there was a recognition that you should be having professionals, but the same in any profession, that professions should be doing what they're trained to do, and therefore there was a real need for social work assistants or family support workers to do more of that hands-on work that you're talking about, setting boundaries, helping people get into a routine, understanding what children need in terms of keeping them healthy, you know, well-behaved and, and, and managing families' sort of stress and, and chaos at times. So, um, you know, there has been, I'm sure if we did a study, there's been, you know, staff lost in those areas. And that means you've got social workers doing a wider range of tasks, possibly, because they've not got that earlier uh, earlier support or that and I think for families as well they find those type of workers what we'd call paraprofessionals much less stigmatized people that can come out in the community do things with them get them used to shopping uh, than a social worker coming to your door uh, we're a very small uh, area and people in the community will know who the social workers are so you know there's a huge stigmatism about, around that we've um We've got uh, some staff within our health visiting service who are funded by education 
uh, which is really helpful, and they're young family support workers. And equally, we have outreach workers from nurseries who are funded from education, and they work really well with those lower level families where the concern isn't around immediate risk, it's about helping families struggle with poverty and maybe some other difficulties that they're experiencing. But I suppose there is a, there's a varied level, and I think what we're experiencing, and again, it's, it's anecdotal, it's not on behalf of Social Work Scotland, um, and it is about what, what I see in Western Barnes, many more complex cases. Um, Can I ask to the others about the resourcing issue? Are we... How many are we short, or have you got an oversupply in your particular area? I wouldn't I'm talking about across the field. In, in terms of the, the staff that are working within child and adolescent mental health, or these particular type of workers? Um, child and adolescent mental health, but that's associated also. So, so we've uh, seen a, a significant increase in the number of staff related to the investment and redesign we've put into the service, which has been in part to address the waiting times issue that's been previously referred to, but has also been to make sure that we've got good provision at tiers one and two, and in particular, as Barry said, at that tier zero level, which is, I think, about your comment is around the community support mm -hmm. that's available. So uh, we have just um, just going on to finalise some recruitment of some extra nursing staff, and then that will be as a, at establishment, we think. Same for Tayside, we had um, an investment. Um, at the start of the last year, 2015, in terms of um, nursing, psychology, also some professional leadership from both medicine and also nursing, mm -hmm. and also um, further work in terms of looking how to um, further enhance the support we had available at Tier 1 to go out and do the education and training, and also support for families. So, um, so at the moment, our biggest issue, I would say, is in recruiting to um, consultant psychiatrist posts. So currently we have um, 2.7 whole-time equivalent vacancies in outpatients and 0.5 vacancy in um, inpatients. And that's been um, quite a long-standing issue in terms of um, there being a shortage of um, individuals available to take up those posts. So that obviously brings some challenges in terms of um, the resource you have available. Um, in Tayside as well, we have um, one um, university outtake that we recruit from. Um, we do recruit very small numbers from elsewhere, but we really rely on um, Dundee University and Abertee and the um, students that they train. Um, and that, therefore, can sometimes restrict the amount of um, registered mental nurses that we have available as well. But at the moment, um, we've managed to recruit um, some additional staff. So. I don't know if that helps or not. I, I mean, we have a panel before us who are saying that they don't need additional resources. That is no, a first. not no. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> In terms of obviously um, additional investment, I think there is a recognition that referral rates are increasing, and um, we're just embarking on another. So we. Last year, we did a, a very big um, look at our demand um, in terms of making sure that we had the right resources, so hence the investment. We're just embarked on another round again to relook at that, knowing that our referral rates have gone up, trying to understand why that is and what it is and where we need then to think for the future. So I'm not saying that we're in a position where we wouldn't need any further investment in CAM services. We also know our hard-to-reach um, populations um, probably don't um, seek services, and I'm sure children and young people are no different from the rest of society. So I'm not complacent, and I'm not um, thinking that we're in a position where we will not need further investment. OK, I'm going to bring in Miles, but um, uh, both uh, or the submissions that I've been reading have referred to um, the issue about looked after children, and particularly those in residential care. I won't comment on that, but I think we have to put that on the record that there are real concerns about uh, that, that group of young mm -hmm. people. Miles, uh, and then we'll have to finish yeah, up. Thank you, Convener. Um, my question was around disparities within the referral system, and to what extent um, does your experience show that um, potential referrals are more successful if they've come from a GP? rather than a named person or from the school, and would you like to comment on that? And as we've got you um, held captive this morning for a wee bit longer, um, is there any priorities which you want to identify yourselves um, from your experience for the next mental health strategy and what you think is important to be included in that? 
I suppose the, the disparities in referral data, um, I couldn't with confidence say that there's one group that refer better or more appropriately than others, but I certainly know that we've uh, locally, and I think colleagues have already mentioned, um, that education work with GPs and referrers to make them clear about what we can achieve within CAMS or what we're looking, if I'm a social worker, what I'm looking for. So I think that does help, as well as being clear about what other services are available prior to that tier three so that people are getting those referrals in early. I think that's the main um, gist of it, other than obviously we've mentioned already that there, there may be a variation in criteria specifically for getting into CAMS, and I think that would be something you would want to eradicate. You'd want that to be standard across Scotland so that families and, and professionals are understanding speaking about the same thing. In terms of the mental health strategy, I think I, I'll go back to probably what I said earlier. I really would like to see, and certainly Social Work Scotland would like to see, that um, emphasis on the tier one and two. Because if, the, if those services aren't there, then children will be exacerbated or escalated into to CAMS uh, services inappropriately in some occasions, or they wait so long they're not getting that service, you know, when they need it, what they need, for how long they need. And that is very variable, and that variability does come down to funding, um, because obviously we've talked about those services being funded by the voluntary sector, uh, some community planning partnerships put money in, you know, in varying ways, but I'm sure that um, what we're picking up is that there is significant gap in that, that area. So to just ask for extra money into CAMS, notwithstanding that the demand has gone up for CAMS, work, particularly in relation to autistic spectrum disorder and ADHD, and those assessments, diagnoses take some time, so they take up a lot of work. Um, I think I would be wanting to see a sort of emphasis on, you know, every community planning partnership having a view of what they've got on that pathway, which is from, I think my colleague said, almost tier zero, which I think is quite a helpful terminology, all the way up, so that people can understand how they route children into the appropriate service at the appropriate point. Obviously, we identified children quite early in the main, but we, it's not unknown for us to suddenly a child reaches secondary school, mid-secondary school, is struggling with a lot of that transition, and that's when their mental health uh, deteriorates rapidly. So it's that kind of balance across. If we just focus on one area, and I suppose that comes back to the, if we only look at waiting times uh, for CAMS, we're missing out a lot of preventative work that we could be doing that will keep children and young people actually from needing CAMS in the future and from needing adult uh, mental health services in the future as well. That's another issue. So there's a sort of almost spend-to-save approach I think needs to be taken. There's much more that we could look at and say on this issue, uh, and I'm sure we will in the future. I can thank the panel very much, and we'll suspend briefly to change the panel. Thank you.
Okay, uh, the second uh, item on our agenda is an evidence session on targets, specifically looking at Scottish Government's review into targets. Uh, could I first of all, uh, before I forget, um, we have received an apology from uh, Colin Smith this morning. Um, could I welcome to the committee Harry Burns, Chair of the Targets and Indicators Review, uh, Jeff Huggins, Director of Health and Social Care Integration, Scottish Government, and uh, Paula McClay, uh, Chief Policy Officer, Health and Social Care uh, at COSLA. Uh, welcome. Um, could I invite you uh, to make an opening statement? Um, when I was asked to, to lead this, this review, um, my discussions with ministers were very much along the lines of, let's have a fresh look. Let's decide what we want out of the complex system that is health and social care. And let's have indicators of progress, which would be based on the principle of information for improvement, not for judgment. Because my experience over the years in which we carried out the Scottish Patient Safety Programme and the Early Years Collaborative and so on was very much along the lines of if you give frontline staff freedom to solve the problems that they encounter and the opportunity to test solutions, they will learn and the system will improve. And as a result, we've had huge reductions in in mortality in Scottish hospitals, huge reductions in infection rates, reductions in infant mortality and stillbirth rate and so on, of a level that no other system has achieved. So it seemed to me that we needed to approach this review with, in mind, targets and indicators should lead us in the direction of a change that we wanted to see. And the change that we want to see is improved health and well-being across the Scottish population, which um, is based on people being in control of their own health and well-being, in control of their own lives, ways in which we support people who are in difficulty to find ways out of that difficulty and become more engaged in, in uh, the pursuit of well-being themselves. So... I'm standing back looking at the whole system. Um, having said that, I think that the public will expect some reassurance around waiting times and that kind of thing. We've made huge progress on waiting times in Scotland over the past few years, certainly since I was a surgeon at the Royal Infirmary, when waiting lists were routinely, people would routinely wait two or three years for uh, elective surgery. Made huge progress. And so we want to keep some of the things that are working, but we want to find new ways of moving the system towards a much more holistic approach to well-being. So that's how we're setting out, what we're setting out to do. Thanks very much. Ivan? Yeah, uh, thanks, Convener, and thanks very much to the panel. Um, and I'm glad to see Harry Burns is leading this, uh, this initiative. Um, I've not got a background in health, right, but I do have a background in performance measurement um, over 30 years in business. Um, and when I started looking at it from a health point of view, I was very confused about the terminology that was used because in Planet NHS, they seem to use words that have got a different meaning to what they have uh, in, in the rest of the world. Um, and I talk about outcomes and targets, etc. Because there's a very well-established process for doing this, right, but the health service seems to have gone off on a tangent. Um, and, and be looking at it from a completely upside down back to front direction. Um, at the end of the day, you figure out what your strategy is, and that seems to be called outcomes in the health world. You then figure out what, uh, what it is you want to measure, your indicators, um, and an indicator has got an outcome, a result, and it's got a target, right? Um, and those are all part of a coherent measurement system. Um, but in the health world, it seems to be an outcome is a completely different thing from a target. They're all part of the same, in my mind, coherent structure. And you need to have that in place to understand where you're going and, and, and how you're getting there. Um, and that's really the first step to then, as you say, drive the performance improvement because you need to know then break that down to various different levels to, uh, to, to understand what, what it's all about. Um, so it was really just to, to get your reflection on that. Um, uh, and, and what you thought round about that process and, and what I'm saying, if I got a correct understanding of, of the kind of mix-up we've, we've managed to get into. I, by 
I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think we have inherited a set of processes. The, the target culture, I think, came from some of the horror stories that we found predominantly, I think, in hospitals in, well, from memory, it was London, where people were lying on trolleys for 40 hours before being seen in A&E departments and so on. Absolutely unacceptable situations. And targets were imposed on the system without any real sense of understanding as to how that would influence the broader suite of activities. Um, things like waiting time targets. When I was a lead clinician for cancer in the uh, 90s, I remember the discussion around treatment time guarantees for people suspected of having cancer, and, and 62 days seemed a reasonable time for people to be seen and get that reassurance. So a lot of the, these things were imposed without due consideration for the broader system. And I think we need to step back and see what that broader system um, is telling us. One of the interesting comments that we had at the first meeting from the emergency medicine community was that the four-hour waiting times... Well, what they said was that the, the, the accident emergency department is a barometer for what's happening outside. It's a barometer for what's happening out in the community. If there's stresses and strains in a community, you see different patterns of um, problems being presented in one place and another and so on. And I think that that's, that's a very insightful comment. But we can't judge performance in those accident emergency departments without consideration of the broader context in which they're working. For example, I mean, there's a lot of stuff about um, breaching four-hour waiting times. When I worked in any departments, which was some years ago, you didn't have CT scanners then. You didn't have MRI scanners in any departments. Any departments were triage places, where if you came in and you had a broken bone, you went to the plaster room. If you had a cut, you went off and got it stitched. If you had a sore tummy, you went to a surgical ward. If you had chest pain, you went to a medical ward and so on. Now all of that investigation in most A and E departments takes place in the A and E department, and treatment starts in the A and E department. If you're having a heart attack, treatment very often will start in the ambulance. And yet we're still acting as if people are hanging around in trolleys. They're on trolleys being investigated and treated. So we need to rethink that. For our target, it's important that people don't lie about in trolleys not being treated, but as soon as they start treatment, that's them not lying around in a trolley. So we're not thinking about the broad system. There's no appreciation of this complexity of modern healthcare. And I think what I would want to do would be to come up over the next few months with some suggested things, get them out in the system for testing, get the opinion of frontline staff as to how it helped them achieve better outcomes for patients and then move on from there. So that's the, we want to start one of this, you know, in, industrial process control is probably not the right uh, way of describing it, but it's a different way of, of thinking about performance within health and social care. No, I'm delighted to hear that. And I, you're right, it's, the targets are essential. The trick is to figure out, measure on the right thing. That's the hard bit. Um, so just a couple other quick comments. One was, do you envisage this would be aligned to the national performance framework um, at a national <laughs> level? And, and secondly, how do we look at the list of people you've got in your expert group? I think there's about 25 or something on it. They all seem to be health professionals. Now, if you were building a hospital, you would call in an architect and a civil engineer. So if you not just have clinicians on it and we're building a performance ma a measurement system, would it not be a good idea to bring in people that have done this in other walks of life? Well, we've got patient reps, we've got um, health and social care reps. We, and we, we have a backup of people very much involved in redesign of services. In fact, in a, another piece of work I've been doing recently brought together, you know, all the modern theorists and I'm writing some stuff up about that just now. So we're feeding a lot of that thinking in. I must I have to pick you up on one thing. You said that we, we did this on the back of uh, things that happened in London. I think many of those things also happened in Scotland. Now, wouldn't you like us to rewrite history at the very start of this? We all have constituents who have experienced similar things up to the present day. Yeah. The four-hour target 
was initiated in England by NHS England on the back of a number of scandals. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that we were perfect. Although, interestingly, we've looked at performance in other countries. Very few other countries up outside the UK impose targets in any departments. And in comparison to those other countries, we actually do pretty well. Um, Donald, first. I'll ask you two questions. There's one specific and one general. The, the, the specific one is um, about the sense of enshrining targets in law. Um, the treatment time guarantee is enshrined in, the, I think it's the Patient Rights Scotland Act 2011. And I looked at the legislation this morning. If there is a breach of the guarantee, I think the Health Board must do three things. It must um, make arrangements to ensure that someone's treated early or the next available opportunity. It must give an explanation to the patient and it must give support and feedback. Now, my own view provisionally is that that doesn't provide any kind of pressure, really substantial pressure to the Health Board. Um, and that one thing I'd, I'd like you to consider in your review is the, is the logic or the sense of, in, of enshrining these targets in, in statute. I mean, it, it doesn't seem really to have much point to it. As I come back to the, I, I would like targets, in, I would like information to be used for improvement. And if you set a target, that's as good as you're ever going to get. And it might be actually we're looking at excelling exceeding those targets, doing better than those targets. It might be that we would find ways of improving way beyond the existing guarantees, but yet yeah, while you've got a target, particularly one enshrined by law, that's as good as you're going to get. Folk aren't going to have any reason to go any further. And I've got an open mind just now. I, I think by the time we sit down, engage with frontline staff, engage with patients and so on, we may well come up with a set of ideas that um, lead to better performance than currently enshrined. I think enshrining things in law, well, that's for you guys to decide, to be honest. Um, but it does ossify the process once you do that. Maybe just to offer something a, a bit more, because one of the, some of the early feedback that we've had, and I guess one of the reasons why we're having the review is because of the perspective that those targets that were enshrined in law have so much more force within the system than other um, issues in respect of provision of services in the community or broader population health gain. So there's the challenge that you're presenting is it's not got enough force, but quite a lot of the feedback that we get is that it has too much force and it distorts, and I guess that's one of the issues that we need to tease out through the review as well. Um, so my, my second was, was a general question, which picks up on what Ivan McKee was asking, which is, um, it seems a fundamental question is what should we be measuring? You know, and uh, we need some kind of benchmark for performance, and I think patient outcome is, is, is talked a, a lot about. There is, I think, uh, a, you know, it, it would be sensible to measure efficiency of some sort. And the, 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 the four-hour A&E target is, is a good example because um, in the public's mind, how long it takes them to get through A&E is, I think, you know, m matters to them. And they will walk out of a hospital either having been seen quite quickly or it having taken for ages. And they will make a judgment in their mind about whether they think that was a, you know, that was a good experience. I, and, yeah, I think... You're right, and I am absolutely accept that. But what we are seeing and what is being presented to me in part is the idea that actually people who may be in the any &E department for four and a half hours, two hours of that time might be them actually being treated and being investigated and things. And, and that is something that in days gone by would have had required an admission to the ward and an overnight stay and so on. So we, we need to collect data to see what is actually happening within that four-hour target and have some kind of rational way of meeting patient expectations for a timely encounter with the health service, but at the same time allow the patient to get rational investigation and treatment. And if that should happen in the A&E department, then so be it. 
as, as you, and I think you, you I think you you realize that it's a it's a much more nuanced picture than yeah. simply me measuring a time frame because Thank I you. spoke I mean we've all heard from hospitals who say well actually the only target is useful because it shows how quickly the hospital people are moving through the hospital and how the hospital itself is working on the other hand I spoke to a doctor who said well actually if if your primary care system is working well then a lot of people might be being seen in primary care in, in, by their GP, not getting to A&E, and then only the hardest cases are getting to A&E, and they're breaching the target because they, they take longer. Yes. There's an interesting Australian study we've encountered where they've reviewed the four-hour waiting time target in 59 hospitals, and what they found is that mortality of patients increases the closer they are to the four-hour target. Now, they haven't in the paper come up with a rational explanation for this, but it seems to me that these are the sicker patients. These are the patients who come in, are being worked on and having things done and being resuscitated and so on. Therefore, mortality will be higher. So we've got to understand the processes that are at work in any &E departments and come up with a rational way of supporting them to support patients. Thank you, to welcome the panel this morning. Thank you for coming to see us. Um, thanks in particular to Sir Harry for that, um, I think, very elucidating uh, opening remarks and subsequent answers in terms of that, the multi-dimensionality of the, the targets we measure at the moment, the, the nuances, I think, are points well made, particularly around uh, A&E waiting times. Um, wait, targets are fresh in the mind of this committee, not least because last week um, we had a cross-examination of the Cabinet Secretary about the Audit Scotland report, which was very uncomfortable reading for the government. Um, whilst, you know, in terms of the eight targets that had been laid out, um, only one was actually met. OK, a couple were nearly, very nearly met, but the, the rest were pretty poor. Um, it was suggested to this committee in that session that actually the targets at which Scotland uh, Audit Scotland were assessing are some of the hardest in the world and that some of the most challenging in the world. I'd like to ask the panel if that's accurate, if that's a good thing, um, if the, it doesn't capture that kind of multi-dimensionality that you're describing, so Harry, which might have offered some kind of mitigation in terms of that, that slightly binary black and white uh, pass-fail report um, that was given to us and how that might be improved. As I say, we have the four UK healthcare systems all have broadly similar targets. Republic of Ireland, Australia and New Zealand are the other three areas that we've looked at that have attempted this kind of target approach. Um, we think that some European countries have targets for some bits of their system, but we can't find consistent publication of data or whatever. And when you look at some of the other, the Republic of Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand, they are far laxer than the ones that we've got. Um, for example, off the top of my head, Republic of Ireland, it's waiting times for admission. From memory, it's something like 25% of patients will be admitted within two months and 100% within a year. You know, whereas ours is much shorter than that. We, we, we have set ourselves pretty challenging targets. And where we fail, my bet is a number of those failures will have robust and sensible explanations underpinning them. And the problem, I think, with the data up until now is that those explanations haven't been sought. You know, it's a target and... All the, you know, all the management evidence that I read is where you have targets, management effort is put into ticking the box. Um, whereas what I would like to do is I want to understand what's going on out there because, you know, if 90% if of people meet the target and 10% don't, you need to learn from those 90% in order to help that 10%. And if all you're concerned about is just ticking the box, you don't learn. I think we can improve way beyond what we're currently doing, but we've got to make that effort and we've got to destigmatize the process in the interim. The other, you know, the other thing is that, well, I mean, I've been looking at data from one of Scotland's largest health boards, which says that the number of patients attending any &E departments has declined significantly over the past few years, which kind of suggests that primary care may well be doing the right thing. 
you know, and again, that didn't come out in the Audit Scotland report. So, you know, there's stuff happening out there that we need to understand a bit more of. And I think the next three or four months is our effort to understand it and to reshape it and to come back. I think the primary target should be for improving the health of the public in Scotland. And what do we need to do in order to achieve that? Through the healthcare system, the social care system, the criminal justice system, the education system. I mean, I, I'm not sure if the Scottish government knew what they were getting when they asked me to do this, but I'm looking at the whole system. Thank you for that. Um, I, I think I, I agree with everything you say. Um, I think it's probably the knee-jerk, visceral reaction of any opposition member, and possibly it's incumbent on us to react like this, to, with some scepticism when a government fails a set of targets, then to commission a review as to whether they, they should be actually you know, setting these targets in the first place. I, I want to go where you're taking us. Um, I just you know, want to have the confidence that we're not just giving the government a pass on this. Absolutely, and I don't hope the knee-jerk reaction against you. <laughs> much. Um, I, I was heartened to hear um, Sir Harry speak about the need to have a much more holistic approach to Scotland's health and well-being. Um, it's obvious that you know targets affect how budgets are. Uh, you know we spend the money to to meet some of these targets, but do you think that that is having an impact on uh, perhaps what some of us might perceive as a lack of intervention and a more preventative approach because we're obsessed with the target at the yeah. end of the day. I'm sure Paula will have some comment to make on that. But yeah, you're absolutely right. At the moment, the budgets are siloed for all the efforts to get integration and so on. If you save money in acute care, investing it in primary care, investing it in social care and so on is different because people are accountable for different bits of that budget. And I think there has to be an effort made to bring that money together. Uh, in order to make sure it flows to the, the correct place. And there are tools for doing that. It's just, I think, that accountability at the moment makes it difficult. Dif different accountability streams makes it difficult for that money to come together. I can say that some of the stuff that I've been looking at around the way in which frontline staff engage with people, there are some studies from England that show substantial reductions in costs in uh, criminal justice, substantial reductions in costs in, uh, in health care when you get things like housing right. And, you know, we need to be thinking very broadly. Pa Paula, you want to... Yeah. Maybe if you could just address this point too. I mean, GPs at the deep end have produced research arguing that the way we allocate NHS resources, um, particularly the Scottish resource allocation formula, doesn't do enough to, to tackle health inequalities. So could you perhaps pick up on that too? Um, I've got some sympathy with that. Um, I come back to the point that health inequalities will not be fixed simply by health care. And again, you know, I make the point, we're just reading about one major set of interventions occurring in the north of England, what they found was that the single most important public sector worker in fixing a lot of these things was the housing officer, you know? And a housing a change, helping people get out of difficulties in their housing seemed to have a big impact on their health and well-being and the way in which, you know, reducing domestic violence and all this kind of thing, reducing stresses and strains. So that's very difficult to... Very difficult to quantify that. You could have some NHS targets around reducing poverty. Um, NHS targets around reducing poverty. I mean, we, we know of you know income maximisation schemes like Healthier, Wealthier Children in Glasgow, where health visitors and midwives helped families yeah. on low incomes access benefits. It's already happening. Uh -huh. Already happening in Lanarkshire. Our early years collaborative um, found that... Um, that health visitors doing 30-month assessments were, are referring people to Money Matters centres and all this kind of thing. And that's what happens when you empower the front line. When you say to the front line, solve the problem here, they come up with innovative solutions and they just get on and do it. So this is part of the culture we want to engender. 
I suppose just to add, I think the value of bringing the, N the review of NHS targets and the review of health and wellbeing indicators together is that we are asking whether the whole system is pulling in the same direction. Um, and that question is a really important one. When you look at individual targets, whether th we know the targets fundamentally drive behaviours, and whether the answer to an A and E target is to invest in A and E or to invest in the preventative services that would keep people out of A and E is is where we need to be focusing our attention. How do we ensure that we've got the right targets and indicators to shift the behaviours to deliver the outcomes that collectively we're actually all in agreement need to be achieved for people? And fundamentally, that's that's the task that's been set here. Just, just two, two things on that. So what we are beginning to see with integration authorities who have the resource for A&E and the resource for unscheduled care bed days is them increasingly looking at what they can do upstream. Uh, and I guess sometimes people say that targets drive money too much, but sometimes you might also say that maybe they don't drive it enough in that you know, the better solution to yeah. what's going on within the hospital sector is better preventative and anticipatory. So the challenge is... We, we now have, um, in some places, we've only had them for seven or eight months. The organisations in place which have this pooled budget, which is able to look across that that component of the system and develop and approach, uh, offer different solutions to the ones that we've had historically, and we're, and we're beginning to see that. In terms of the health and wellbeing outcomes that support integration, the, the fifth of those is a requirement in partnerships that they address health inequalities, and what we're seeing within that is exactly the sort of project and work that you've identified there and they'll be required on an annual basis to report on what they've done to address health inequalities within the areas that they're responsible for which is going beyond simply healthcare systems. Well, one, one of the processes that we introduced in the patient safety program and the early years collaborative and so on is encouraging people to collect data on a daily basis. You know, how many people did you see today? How many people did you give debt advice to? How many people took up the debt advice? How many people have come back and said, yes, I'm better off as a result? And, yeah, you know, having annual reports is one thing, but what keeps the frontline staff trying new things is seeing the run charts up on the wall that says, yes, actually... I mean, the, the classic example I use in my lectures is um, bedtime stories for children in the Early Years Collaborative. We know that enhances cognitive ability and so on. The nurseries just asked the kids, did they get a bedtime story? And they, were, they did things, and gradually it went from 60% of children to 90% of children because they were following it on a daily basis. When we implemented infection control, specific infection control programs in, in the patient safety program, the more there was compliance with the program, the lower the infection rate went. And that's tremendously motivating to frontline staff. They see change happening and they want to make it happen. So we want to discuss a key bit of this is the methods that we use to implement these high level objectives, not I, I, and I would suggest that annual reports aren't sensitive enough. We need that day-to-day -day flow of information. Can I ask at the beginning, you listed successes that are, you know, on infection control and mortality rates and all. A um, couple of things. How many of those successes have been driven by the targets? And if we were meeting the targets, would we be reviewing them? Er, the, the patient safety programme and the earliest collaborative set their own objectives. They said, you know, you, when you try to do this, okay, you get the system together and you say, okay, what do you want to achieve? The earliest collaborative, it was make Scotland the best place in the world for children to grow up. How do we know we will get there? Well, if we reduce infant mortality by 15% by the end of 2015, if we reduce stillbirth rate by 15% by 2015, if we improve developmental progress to 85% by age three and so on, frontline staff set those aims and then they set about trying things that would achieve it. Mm -hmm. So we made the 15% reduction in infant mortality. We overperformed on stillbirth rate. It's 18% reduction. We will know at the end of this year about the other ones and so on. But the point is that if someone from outside comes and imposes something on the front line and they've had no say in whether or not that's a credible objective, then they maybe aren't as engaged. But you get them to set it. They will set a more challenging... I, 
for not for a second did I think we would reduce infant mortality by 15%. I can't find any other country in the world that's done that over the last three years. But they did it. They, so, so it's a different approach to externally set targets. This is set by the system. And the system tests ways of achieving that target. So you know right from the start that they're engaged with it. And it might be that that's something we come up with in the course of this review. It might not. It might be we have a mix of externally imposed targets. Eating them would be, re be reviewing them. If, if we were meeting the targets, would we be reviewing them? Well, Could, maybe just to offer something on that. I, I suppose the, there's a wider context to the work that's going on in Scotland at the moment. So the OECD at their ministerial meeting early next year is looking at how healthcare, advanced healthcare systems across the world look at issues to do with quality and performance. And the expectation there is increasingly the, they'll be moving towards patient reported outcomes. So not how did the system as a machine operate, but what was your experience of health and care? Did you feel safe? Did you feel listened to? Did you feel that you had control over what happened? Um, so we, we have, we have a, a wider context of what's happening in terms of how we understand what healthcare systems are for. Michael Porter, in his work on value-based healthcare, again, looks at the moving beyond simply the how fast did it happen or how much did it cost to the gr degree to which it produces either greater health or greater satisfaction. So thinking again about how people actually understand their relationship to the healthcare system. And the challenge with these things are because increasingly they become relate to people's expectations and people's experience in a very complex distributed system is they're probably more difficult to achieve than mechanical targets in that it's probably more difficult to offer satisfaction to a population of 5 million people in terms of their experience each time they go across the door of the GP surgery than simply saying how quickly were they seen so the, the challenge within this is actually opening up a space where different forms of data collection are likely to be required, but also different ways of understanding the benefit that people receive are likely to be required, and, and they're not necessarily easier things to do. So I, I, think, I, think, I think you have to understand that while there will still be, um, you know, and we expect that there still will be things in respect of efficiency and sustainability, and that people expect a predictable healthcare system, they expect one to be well managed, but the ask that's been put in here, which relates to people's experience of their own health and well-being and the de degree to which you produce health gain, is quite a big ask. So I, th I, you know, I think, mm -hmm. please don't underestimate the, um, the ambition of this work. A few years ago, um, it's only a few years ago since the push came to the, for the 12-week target. Um, did, I don't know how long you've you've been in post, uh, Mr Huggins, or your predecessor or people within that directorate, but did they... Did they um, encourage or discourage government from going down that route of targets? And are the same people who were sitting, you know, advising on that, are they in post now saying, well, actually, we need to move away from something that we were actually involved in implementing? I'm trying so, to get the bot to the bottom of how, how the decision was made in the first place and how some of the people who pushed for that decision might be in the same place and saying actually we were wrong on that. Now, that, there's nothing wrong with people saying they were wrong, it was the wrong approach. And indeed some of the stakeholders who have been involved, uh, I went to an RCN seminar recently where the RCN said, you know, at the time we were kind of all involved in it, there was a bit of an atmosphere around and everybody just went along with it and maybe we shouldn't have. Now, plain devil's advocate here is part of our role in this committee. Is it the case that maybe some people are sitting saying, this is the kind of mood and atmosphere now, and maybe we should just go along with it, where actually they might, in the same number of years, regret that? I suppose I, I can't entirely understand the different motivations that a range of people would have had for saying different things um, or saying what they said at the time when they said it. Our, our, our challenge around this is that... Um, Often what people say to us is that they would wish that we review targets because they think that we have the wrong targets or we, we have the targets which are too specific. But then quite often what they ask for is a target which relates to their particular specialism or professional interest as being the one that we actually do need. So p people will say different things for different reasons. Um, I, I think as I've indicated, the, the broader context within which we understand targets and performance and outcomes and indicators continues to move on. So if, if we think that we go back even three or four years, and maybe the, the work on the indicators is a good illustration of this, 
the, the first nine of the indicators with, that support the outcomes, the nine health and care outcomes, largely would be derived from information which comes from the um, Scottish Health Survey. So we ask qualitative questions of the population. And at that time, that seemed to be the best methodology for understanding people's experience of healthcare, their sense of safety, their sense of control, thing, things like that. I think for exactly the reason that Harry's outlined in terms of you know, the, the need to have real-time day-to-day information which gives feedback loops and engages people in the service they deliver, our view is now, and this is one of the reasons why we're reviewing the indicators, is we need faster access to knowledge about people's experience of healthcare. Now, the idea within that is still we need access to people's experience of healthcare, but the methodology that we used to get that information has moved on. <laughs> our understanding of the change process has moved on. So, and so now we're looking to develop systems which enable partnerships to know this week what the experience was, not what it was 18 months ago when the survey was done after it's been collated and published, because that doesn't give them any, uh, any ability. So the broad themes continue to be there, but the methodology by which we get to them continues to be the same. So you know, again, the example was given um, earlier and was discussed at the, the first meeting of the expert group in respect of the 4R target. And different people have different views and have had different views of that over time. At the same time, it is a good indicator of overall sustainability and overall um, um, the ability of the system to, 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 to run effectively. How we understand that as part of a broader objective of producing health gain and a, a, the wider benefits of the health and care system will probably change over time, but we'll still need something to do that function within the system. Just Partly my question has been answered, but you know, I, I have to say, I have respect for, uh, uh, great respect for Sir Harry Burns. I'm sure he'll do a, a good job. But Mr. Huggins, boards are diverting resources to meet targets. Disproportionate amounts of money are being spent in order to manipulate targets, bring in people to, um, you know, surgeons or whatever to work overtime. You know, that's the charges that are going to be made against you and the Scottish Government, and the charges are, you haven't met these targets, you know, so you're changing the system. So what is your, I know you've partly answered my question, but in all honesty, do you agree with me that over the years we've built up so many targets, so many ways of doing things, so many political parties attacking the health service, attacking people like yourself, so you brought in the targets, you're responsible, so what are we going to do about it? How are we going to solve it? How are we going to make sure that people like me and others don't turn around to you and say, oh, you're going to manipulate it again? So that we can have clear uh, and concise targets that m are meaningful to people, are meaningful to the public, and everyone can respect those targets. And at the end of the day, I'd like you to answer it, Mr Harry Burns, because... Harry, Sir Harry Burns has spoke for most of the meeting and I've, I've listened to him intently. I want to ask you how we are going to get the right targets in place that can be respected by all political parties and the general public. Yeah. Well, um, as Sir Harry Burns has outlined, we have a process in place to seek a wide range of views. Um, we have the ability to draw on expert advice. We have the ability to test the ideas that come out of the review process, and, and that's, what we're, that's what we'll do. Um, I think the, you know, the, the challenge that we have is that we're looking to do something which is complex um, and which will need to operate on a number of levels. So it will need to um, take us to the situation where we're able to produce better health which is the intention of the, the health and care system, um, that we're able to, to demonstrate that the system is running effectively and, and that we're able to, to give confidence to those who hold us accountable um, that the stewardship of the system is being discharged in an effective way. Now, those are, those are a range of slightly different ideas and I guess the challenge that we have around the review is we tend to load all of our expectations onto this review of targets as that this will be the mechanism by we fix a range of ills. Um, and this will be part of a solution, but it's only one part of the solution that we need to bring forward. Mr Harry Burns, one question, uh, and I know you'll comment back on. Are you under any pressure at all to deliver a certain targets or 
what your uh, group is going to come up with will be fully accepted by the government? I think you know me well enough to know that I can, I'm pretty good at withstanding pressure. And I would never put my name to something that I didn't fundamentally believe in. And um, in discussions with ministers, I've said, look, I want to stand back and take an overall view of this. But however, I do recognise the fact that there will be public expectation around some guarantees of the way that they are treated. And I will do my best to make sure that we bring all those competing priorities together and come up with something that is credible and insightful and does something for the well-being of the people of Scotland. That's the fundamental thing in my head. Overall, it's not about how fast you go through a bit of the system. It's about how well people are and can we move them to a better place. Commenting on Jeff's uh, answer... We are where we are because at the time these things were brought in, that's what people did. That was the notion in people's head as to how you moved a system, and we've learned from that. We will come up with a, an insightful way forward, but five years from now, there may well be some other insights that emerge that will lead us to tweak the system even further. So we can never say there is a gold standard set of targets. Where I would hope to get, I mean, I'm now that I'm no longer, um, now that I'm a free agent in terms of an academic, um, I'm going all around the world just now telling people about the changes Scotland have made. I mean, people are asking me to go and help them set up an early years collaborative in the same way that we've done it. They want to know what our thinking is around health inequalities and all this kind of stuff. Scotland is getting a lot of attention because of what we have already achieved. And what I see is a next phase of this coming along. But I'm not fooling myself that in the process we won't learn even more about it and then find a, an even better way of doing it. That's the way systems change. Can I just say on, on the point of if we'd met all of these targets, would we still be doing this review? My answer would be I certainly hope so, because how well we're doing or not right now in terms of those targets is no indication of whether the system we've got is fit for purpose for the future that we want to achieve, whether it will drive the changes that are about uh, changed models of care, shifting the balance of care, more care in the communities, investment in social care, and supporting people's outcomes. So what we have at the moment is siloed and operational, and it's not that those things don't have a place, but they're unlikely to get us where we want to be for the future. And so regardless of what the performance indicators are right now telling us about the system, I certainly hope we would be having this review to ask whether the whole system can drive the change that we want to see and support the change we want to see. Thank you, Sabina. Um, the Scotland report um, maybe doesn't point towards this, but to what extent do you think there is manipulation and massaging of these figures taking place around the targets? I've met with professionals, and I, I don't say this to criticise them, but they are um, not putting people on the system because they know they're not going to meet their targets. So that's both in um, CAMS and also in alcohol and drug partnerships. I've seen that happening. I know of that happening. To what extent do you, from your work you've done, um, know that's taking place? And, and my concern would be, whatever we put in place, that will happen all over again. And secondly, where do you think the realistic medicine agenda fits into this as well? Well, certainly from the first meeting of the expert group, this issue was something I raised with the emergency medicine people, and they said that they, if that was happening, it was happening at a very, very small number of cases, but the ones that I was speaking to said they are just working hard to achieve the four-hour target. As far as the, the CAMS lot are concerned. I don't know. I haven't specifically asked them, and it's not something I have any direct experience of. I don't know, Jeff, if you've got any comment on that. We, we did do, we did a review, I think about three years ago, following the challenges that we had in Lothian to assure ourselves that what we had seen in Lothian wasn't happening elsewhere. And at that time, we were satisfied with the outcome of the review. I think if you have information that suggests there are things that you think that we should look at, 
we would be very happy to look at them. In our experience, though, is that in, in terms of the, the value that clinicians take from targets is that they see it as being something which gives them influence also in terms of um, securing resource. And so artificially presenting a better position than they're in isn't always seen as being necessarily the best way forward. So, But if you have information, I'd, I'd very, very much be happy to see it. The other element of this is that um, part of the improvement process is allowing frontline staff to try things out, to do something different and see if that is produces a better result. And what I say to them is, if it works, tell everyone about it. And if it doesn't work, tell everyone about it. The only shame and failure is not telling people about it because they don't learn that that particular intervention doesn't work. So if there is a kind of punitive sense out there, that's not a good thing. You know, information should be used for improvement. If, if there's a failure, why did it happen? And what can we do the next time to make sure it doesn't happen? And if we create that kind of climate, the whole system will gradually improve. Well, the end was that uh, the manipulation of the system was happening and no one was being told about it. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. Could be. Uh, okay. So, Claire, some points. Oh, realistic medicine, yeah. I think this is entirely compatible with the Chief Medical Officer's approach to realistic medicine. Um, as I say, the medical system is part of the broader health system, which is part of the broader social system, and the broader social system needs to change in order mm -hmm. to achieve this well-being agenda for Scotland. So it fits in very nicely. It offers a way of conceptualising the healthcare contribution to this. So I'll be having conversations with her to to make sure that we're all on the same page. Yeah. Could I ask finally just the um, time scale uh, and what happens next? What's the what's going to happen with the system that you've undertaken? We're developing some work streams around uh, understanding the data around gathering evidence from what's happened elsewhere as to what might make these improvements and around understanding how they might be applied in Scotland, the method that might be used to, to drive the changes. I would hope by the end of March, round about April, to have an initial report ready for ministers. And I would hope that that would include some proposals for testing trying things out and seeing that they don't create perverse incentives within the system or they don't create um, you know, unanticipated effects. And if that's the case, then to adopt a continual improvement process approach to delivery of services. In the course of that process, we would want to engage with the public in a number of ways. And, I, you know, and obviously this committee, the members of this committee are a key link to constituents and so on. So we would want to hear your views. So, so when is that likely to be in the public domain? For well, end of March. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can I now uh, thank uh, the panel very much for their attendance this morning and can I suspend briefly to change the panel? Thank you.